Conversations with Pan Since the original meeting with Pan on the mound in Edinburgh in April 1966, there have been many others, mainly in the Botanic Garden. This talk includes extracts from the conversations that took place between us. Some of the material was personal for myself alone and has been omitted. The method of communication is the same as before. The basic exchange between us is probably in the form of images and symbols which are received by my unconscious mind and translated into words in my consciousness. I hear the sound of the words in my head, so it is natural to write them down in the form of a dialogue between the disembodied entity and myself. On Friday, the 23rd of June, 1972, I went to the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh in the early afternoon. It was Midsummer Eve, an important day for the nature spirits. A dull day, but there were blinks of sunshine. I came into the garden from Inverleith Row by the east gate and took the path to the left, leading to the rock garden. I stopped to look at a horse chestnut, which has always fascinated me because of the strange markings on the bark, which look like hieroglyphics or ancient native carvings. I'm sure they mean something, but so far I have not been able to decipher them. A little beyond this tree I left the path and went up the grassy slope to go on through the heath garden, which was suddenly alive with nature spirits. Green elves three to four feet tall were walking in front of me, full of joy and delight, and little gnomes were running about almost under my feet. Kurmos came towards me from amongst the bushes, still the beautiful little fawn who was my first contact with these beings. He greeted me with joy and turning danced off in front of me between the elves. Pan was with me, very powerful on my left, as I walked on to the top of the heath garden, towards the tree of life. This tree, Zelkova carpinifolia, referred to as the tree of life by Richards and Barb Baker, the man of the trees, is a strange tree, which I like to greet when I go to the garden. Even this specimen, which is not large, has a powerful field. I walked round it clockwise, and then stood looking at a part of the bark just below the level of my head. My attention was caught by a group of markings on the bark that were in the form of a figure about fourteen inches high. I'd often looked at this tree, but had never seen this effect before. The figure was distinct. It was strange and slightly sinister, a fawn-like being with longish straight horns. The eyes were quite noticeable. I had been aware of the tree spirit, but had never seen it before. Was this a representation of it on the bark? A slight mist formed between me and the tree, and I found myself looking at the entity itself, standing in front of the tree. He was about my own height, thick-set and dark-skinned. His eyes, which were fierce, challenged me. Afraid? No. Would you have felt so drawn to my tree if you had seen me before? Yes, I think so. Will you touch the tree as you have always done, aware this time that you are doing it through me? I laid my hand on the trunk of the tree and felt the usual strong flow of energy. Will you lean your back against the tree again through me? I did so, and was aware of a strange warming energy. You find me odd, not what you expected. You are not repulsed? I am disconcerted. You certainly are not what I expected, but I love this tree, and you are the tree. You are not evil. I am neither good nor evil. My tree has been called the tree of life. I am what you make of me. I moved away from the tree and turned round. I was aware of the tree spirit standing against the trunk where I had been leaning, strong, powerful, and strange. 
In spite of his appearance, I felt activation of the heart centre. Pan was again beside me. He had moved away from me as I approached the tree. "'You are developing in the right direction,' he said, smiling. "'More and more easily you are able to accept the strange looking of my subjects with discernment, being aware of the true quality of the elemental, and not put off by their apparently sinister aspect, able instead to feel love and respect.' I have always felt a special attraction for this tree ever since I first came across it some years ago. When I lean against the trunk, I draw much energy from it. Seeing this aspect of the tree spirit has made no difference? No. The energy field of the tree is unchanged. I looked at Pan inquiringly. You said this aspect of the tree spirit, meaning he has others? Yes, he has others. The form in which he shows himself is suited to the occasion. It has a purpose, to test my reaction or to disconcert me. Pan smiled. Perhaps a bit of both? Your reaction was good. Where do you want to go next? I indicated a path that skirts the south side of the rock garden and proceeded along it. Kormos and the elves were still ahead of us in the distance. Most of the clouds had dispersed, and the sun was shining, and I felt great happiness. Some distance ahead, where the path is bordered by bushes and trees, there was an empty seat. But before sitting down, I decided to visit the redwood trees, which I love so much. There are six or seven of them, arranged in a rough circle. These trees radiate a quite different kind of energy than any other tree. They are young trees, not yet very large, but they are beautiful. Kulmos and the elves had disappeared, and Pan was no longer with me. A seat near the trees was occupied by a man reading a paper, and a long-haired youth was sitting on the ground near a border sketching flowers. I couldn't very well embrace the trees as I would have liked to have done, or even talk to them except mentally. I walked round them and then stood for a few moments in the centre of the circle, before returning to the empty seat I had seen. It was, of course, now occupied. Obviously not the right place for me. As I turned towards another path, which curved round a rhododendron bush, Kormos came running out of it and beckoned. He turned, and I followed him along the curving path to an empty seat. The path was narrow, and I felt enclosed by trees and bushes and very close to nature. I watched two bullfinches in the bush opposite. Some sparrows came twittering down onto the path, hoping perhaps for breadcrumbs. A blackbird was hopping about almost in front of me, and a squirrel dashed across the path and climbed about a yard up a tree trunk, disappearing round the back of it. It must have jumped into a bush close by, as I could see its tail, which remained motionless for some time. Then the tail disappeared with a flick, and the squirrel came out from under another bush, onto the edge of the path. It sat up, looking at me, came a few feet towards me, and then turning, scampered off. Kormos, who had been standing in the middle of the path, watching, came and sat beside me. This reminds me of our first meeting, I said, when you asked me, why are human beings so stupid? Kormos looked up at me with a mischievous grin. You can't answer that question, can you? No, I can't. Since I have come to see the human race through the eyes of beings like yourself, I sometimes wonder how you can put up with us at all. We find human behavior amusing at times, but so often it is destructive, cruel, and horrible, or so it seems to us. It makes us sad. We try to understand, but it isn't easy. 
We know there are those who love nature, who love this garden, and find happiness and peace amongst the flowers, bushes, and trees, who love the birds and the squirrels and feed them with crumbs and nuts. No doubt they would love us if they could see us. This makes us happy, and we draw near to them. Some of them may even be aware of us, though they cannot see us. Why can you see us so clearly? I suppose I am a privileged person, one of those chosen to link with Pan and help to renew the old contact between mankind and the nature spirits. Pan appeared at that moment standing opposite us. You were chosen because you are suited to the task. Your entire life has been a training and preparation for this and for other things. As soon as the integration between your lower self and your higher self reached a certain degree of completion, you were bound to see us. Your lower self and your physical body had to be trained and conditioned for many years before this level could be reached. To see and communicate with us in the way you do requires just as much training as the skilled brain surgeon or virtuoso musician. You know well how long it has taken, and we are speaking only of this life. Kumas looked at me. Now I understand, he said. He rose and turned to Pan, who placed his hand on the little fawn's head and looked down at him with infinite affection in his eyes. You too were chosen for the part you played in bringing about our meeting, my little henchman. A slow, beatific smile spread over the fawn's face. He appeared to grow in stature. He gave a cry, spun round and went dancing down the path. Pan looked after him, smiling, then crossed and sat beside me. Your work must have its problems. Yes, many problems. Mainly interesting ones, often amusing, sometimes disconcerting. Now that I accept the fact that what is happening is real, I am becoming used to the problems. There was a time when I doubted, when it seemed to me that the whole thing might be a fantasy, projections from my own unconscious. But to think of you as a projection of a constellated part of my own unconscious, or as a secondary personality, as the clever, all-knowing psychologist might maintain, seems to me totally ridiculous. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. A great being like yourself could never be part of my unconscious. Pan looked at me with a curious smile a smile I knew well. Have you never felt that I was within you? Oh, yes. There were the times when you walked into me as you did on the mile walk at Attingham, and I saw the outside world through your eyes. Would you say I possessed you? No, it was not possession, which usually implies something unpleasant or evil. It was identification, a kind of integration which is quite different from possession. Apart from those times, have you never felt that I was somehow within you? Yes, yes, of course I have. I looked at him. Now I understand what you mean. We are told to turn within, to seek God within, to seek Christ within. But this withinness is not contained in my physical body, which would limit it. It is in all dimensions of space and time. It is infinite. It is the eternal now. We turn away from the outside world, the material world, which so many believe to be the only reality, to seek that other reality, the true reality, which is within, and yet is everywhere. Pan, by his questions, had released a deep inner knowledge from my unconscious mind, where it had been stored. It was now flowing out in a way that surprised myself. In that sense, of course, I continued, you are within me. The whole universe is within me. 
the elemental kingdom, the angelic hierarchy. Christ is within me. God himself is within me. This withinness is the all, the great mystery which we poor humans cannot hope to understand completely. We can only grope towards it and in some way seek to apprehend it. If we believe it is possible to do this, we will find what we seek, at least a facet of the ultimate truth. Pan placed his hand on my arm. Looked at in one way, your clever, all-knowing psychologist is right. I am within you, but the projection is unnecessary. To turn within in the right way and center oneself on the cosmic Christ is to develop cosmic consciousness and bring about integration between the lower and higher selves. When a certain degree of this development has been reached and you turn without to the contemplation of the material world through the medium of the physical senses, you see it in a different way because you are now aware of and in touch with the true reality behind it. Because of the ray you are on and the work you have to do, you see me and my subjects as if we were part of the material world. This is not projection. It is bringing cosmic reality into manifestation when it is right to do so. For, of course, you do not see us as part of the material world all the time. That would be too much. Your physical body could not take it, and it would lead to confusion. It happens for a reason when it is necessary and will increase your understanding of the elemental kingdom. In which case your sensitivity is stepped up to bring it about, and one or more of us will become visible to you as required. Only on rare occasions, like the one on the mile walk at Attingham, where you say, I stepped into you, do you see the lot, or at least as much of it as you can take. Pan looked at me with a twinkle. Can you explain the mechanism, I asked. I am certain it is not due to heightened sensitivity of physical sight only. It is a mixture of that, plus an added higher vision brought about by the development of cosmic consciousness. That makes sense to me. But I am unable to control it myself. For instance, I cannot wish to see a nature spirit and immediately do so, however hard I try. It is done from our side, when it is right for you to have the heightened vision, or when a particular entity wishes to become visible to you. How is it done? Pan laughed and shrugged his shoulders. There you go again with your questions. How else can I find out? I want to know. That is, if it is possible to explain to a three-dimensional mortal who can use only a small part of his brain. All right. I'll do my best by an analogy. Imagine a theatre with a large stage. A theatre? My dear Pan, what do you, the god of the elemental world, know about man's places of entertainment? All that's necessary. Remember I am everywhere. Have you forgotten the time when I sat in the empty seat beside you at a performance of Midsummer Night's Dream at the Edinburgh Festival? I laughed delightedly. I have not. You liked the little Welshman's puck. It was acceptable. But to return to my analogy which you interrupted. The stage is in darkness. It is thronged with people, but you cannot see them because of the darkness, which symbolizes your lack of sensitivity. A narrow beam spotlight picks out one of them and he immediately becomes visible to you. Any number of different individuals can be picked out and become visible in this way. Similarly, lights could pick out a group or the whole stage could be lit. The light symbolizes your heightened senses. It is a rough analogy, but it may answer your question. It does. 
The lights are controlled by some being on your side, I take it? Yes. Therefore, I can't select the entities I am to see or when. But I am aware of and can communicate with your subjects. Of course, you can do this at any time, though you may only be able to see us on special occasions. The moment you think of an entity, you are in immediate communication with it. You may or may not be aware of the response according to your degree of sensitivity at the time. But it will almost certainly be there. Can anyone make such a contact? Yes, anyone can, and it is important that this should be understood. The one-way contact is always there, but being aware of the response usually needs training, or at least practice. It is very subtle and easily missed. What saddens me is when others are envious of the gift I have been given. Why was I chosen? Why not them? It isn't fair. Fortunately, there are not many. But there are many who would genuinely and sincerely like to share my experiences, and I am frequently asked how they can set about it. And you hedge and say some day you probably will if your faith is strong enough. Don't try too hard. It will just happen at the unexpected moment. I laughed. No doubt you've heard me at it. I certainly have. And it is sound advice. You also tell them to follow your example and live in comparative isolation in the country for ten years as you did yourself. I do. And most of them look aghast and say they could not possibly do that. They haven't the time. And it might mean giving up too much. There are people who want the easy way every time. How to see fairies in six simple lessons. There is always time for the important things. Communicating with my subjects is not a garden game for the odd half hour when there is nothing better to do. It is of vital importance for the survival of mankind. Unless man comes to realize the dangerous stupidity of outraging nature and stops the ever-increasing rate of pollution, he will ultimately destroy himself. Seeking cooperation between the three kingdoms, the Davic, the nature, and man's, as is a name at Findhorn, is one way of helping mankind to survive. In your case, if you had not spent those years at Cowfoot Cottage, you would never have seen either me or any of my subjects. It was a basic necessity. Another question that arises in the desire to communicate with elemental beings is the motive behind it. Curiosity is an important quality when it is the right sort of curiosity, such as seeking after truth. There is another kind, idle curiosity, wanting to know what is going on, not to find out truth or useful information, but just to probe. How nice it would be to be able to see lots and lots of harmless little fairies and dear little gnomes dancing about in the garden. Of course, they have very little power, but they are such fun, dear little pets that don't need any looking after. Pam seemed to swell in size, and the power radiating from him stepped up. I have observed far too much of this contemptuous, superior attitude of man towards my subjects. It is almost worse than disbelief. The smallest of them has more potential power than the strongest human being. It is lucky for mankind that we are infinitely tolerant and understanding and that we obey God's will. If we used a fraction of the power we have, we could wipe the whole of mankind off the face of the earth. We are not here to be the slaves of man. 
but to collaborate with him to bring about a world of peace, cooperation and brotherly love, a world free from wars and violence. Man's disbelief in our existence does not destroy us. It can never do that. We are here, and we shall always be here even if man destroys himself and his material planet. Man is losing his dominion over the other kingdoms with which he shares the earth by his destructive behavior, selfishness, and stupidity. It is time he looked and saw what he is doing. He must face up to the consequences of his behavior which he cannot escape. If he does not, a time will come when only actions will teach him the necessary lessons by then, it may be too late. I drew a deep breath. My dear Pan, your power is terrifying. You've almost blasted me out of existence. His stern face relaxed into a smile. I'm sorry. I certainly have no wish to do that. Even I sometimes get carried away by anger. Let's leave it at that and return to the genuine people who are legitimately curious about my world and would dearly love to see us. There is nothing wrong with that except that it very rarely works. They try too hard. Perhaps this is fortunate, as they do not realize how dangerous it might be if their desire was granted too soon before either their bodies or their minds had been prepared and conditioned for the experience and the right degree of cosmic consciousness had been reached. The elementals, the ones who are my subjects, belong to a different evolutionary stream than man. Close contact between human beings and the elementals can be dangerous if it takes place too soon especially if the motives for seeking it are wrong. My subjects are strange beings, as you well know. But really close links are only necessary with those who have special work to do. Many people who believe in the nature spirits and love them can be aware of them, can communicate and sometimes even see them in brief glimpses. With such people, they will always cooperate when invoked, which simply means asking for help. This simple awareness is open to anyone who seeks it. It is the complete, total link that must be initiated from our side when it is required. What would happen to an unprepared person who tried to make the close link, or to someone with the wrong motives? Such a link is easily enough made, but it would be on the wrong level, with the wrong type of being, probably on the lower astral plane. Tell me more about this. So far, we have been talking about the pure elementals, whose basic light bodies are vortices of energy, which I believe to belong to the angelic hierarchy and who take on etheric bodies formed of substance drawn from the etheric shell of the earth in order to carry out their functions. These are the bodies that become personified as elves, fauns, fire elementals, air and water spirits, and so on. Such as are preserved as thought forms in man's myths and legends. As well as these, I know that there are other entities of a different type, which I have referred to as pseudo-elementals. You certainly know that they exist, as you can both see and communicate with them, and have sometimes had to deal with them. Goblins, the black salt, imps, and a whole collection of nightmare horrors we need not go into. They are not your subjects, then? Pan gave me a look of mock horror. Certainly not. I wouldn't acknowledge them. Do they have a god, or a leader of some sort? Pan sighed. Yes, unfortunately. My opposite. Call him anti-Pan, if you like, so it sounds odd. Everything about him is odd. 
You might regard him as a debased aspect of myself, a detached shadow. Oh, we are quite good friends, in a way, as he has a necessary part to play. I keep him at arm's length. Is he at all like you? Well, yes, in a debased sort of way. His horns are longer and vicious-looking. He has real goat's legs and coarse hair. He smells of goat. He is the real nymph-chasing satyr, the goat god, the true model for the devil. He is very earthy. Unfortunately, too many people take him for me. That is the reason for the bad reputation I have in some quarters. Is it easy to contact him? Too easy. Invoke him with the right noises, and he'll be there, masquerading as me. What can you do about it? More than you think. But I usually leave it unless he goes too far. The fools who invoke him deserve what's coming to them. But do they know what they're doing? Not always. But the truth comes to the surface in the end. There is too much negative energy involved. It shows. The balance is invariably upset and brings about consequences that cannot be ignored. What sort of people can invoke him? All sorts. Very often beautiful people with the highest ideals and good intentions. But they are earth-oriented and of some kind of negative quality about them. Their cosmic consciousness is not highly developed, if at all. Is he evil? Not necessarily. That depends on how he is invoked and by whom. He is a negative entity who brings negative energies with him. As I said, he has a role to play. But that's enough. I don't like talking about him. And on that last word, Pan withdrew. That is to say, he disappeared from my sight. I spent some time walking about the botanic garden, thinking over our conversation, and then I went home. The next extract is from another meeting in the garden, on the 30th of October, the same year, 1972. As on the previous occasion, I had gone to the garden in the early afternoon. This time, I went to the rock garden itself and walked through it, absorbing its special atmosphere. As I reached the end of it and crossed the path, I was more conscious than usual of the livingness of the trees and bushes ahead of me, and of a closeness to and identification with the earth and the whole vegetable kingdom. I went across the grass in the direction of my favourite redwood trees. After greeting the trees, as I usually do, I went on by a grass path through the trees and bushes, conscious of an ever-increasing intensity of feeling, causing my whole body to tingle and giving the experience I have described before as more real than real. And that intense three-dimensionalness that produces a feeling of ecstasy. I came out of the path onto more open ground and went diagonally down the slope. As I did so, I experienced a tremendous feeling of exultation. Such experiences are difficult to express in words and can never be adequately recounted. Only a pale reflection of the actual experience gets across and one has a sense of frustration, because there is a shortage of the right meaningful words to give it true expression. When I reached the path I was making for, I crossed it and went to a seat a little way beyond it on the grass, where I sat and looked at the nearby trees. How vitally alive they were, though some of them had lost nearly all their leaves. I immediately became aware that not only were they alive, but they were communicating with me. The trees themselves, that is, not the tree spirits or the nature beings still working with them. I was not only overwhelmed by the love they were sending out, 
but realized that they were giving me thanks for the work I was being used for in passing on knowledge to people about the consciousness and sensitivity of the vegetable kingdom and the reality of the elemental helpers. The trees claimed me as one of themselves. This feeling of total oneness with all nature was wonderful. The unexpected appreciation was deeply moving. I now felt that my life had been worthwhile. Pan was sitting beside me looking at me with amused affection. There was a sense of timeless wonder. The garden was full of nature beings. I expressed surprise at seeing so many of them at this time of year. Why not? Look at the number of trees that still have leaves on them. There is plenty of work to be done. Don't you think this is a beautiful time of the year? I certainly do. The autumn colorings are superb. How do you think the changes in color are brought about? Who are the artists responsible for them? I looked at him in surprise. Do you mean your subjects are responsible? I never thought of that. Yes, my subjects are responsible. They are, as you see, superb artists. Of course, the botanist will tell you differently. He has his explanation, I have mine. Which do you think is right? Take your choice. Both are probably right. It all depends on the way you look at it. Pan laughed. Both are right. You develop in wisdom. I have good teachers. Pan stood up and laughed. Come, let us move on. I rose from the seat and we began to walk in the direction of the west gate. There was one part of the garden I felt we had to go to, which I always think of as Pan's special place, a wild part, though it is not so wild now as it used to be. The grass which was once allowed to grow has been cut short. In spite of this, it has lost nothing of its mysterious atmosphere. We passed the road leading to the gate, and as we walked on, Pan turned to me and said, All the time you lived at Cowford Cottage, you were unaware of the existence of such beings as nature spirits, in spite of your lifelong interest in esoteric and occult subjects. At that time, I would have dismissed belief in the real existence of fairies, gnomes, or elves as superstition, as figments of the imagination. The result of your scientific training? I tried hard to find rational explanations for all the psychic phenomena I had come across and studied. But there were certain phenomena I had to accept, which I could not explain away. Why are you asking these questions? You must be able to read my mind, so you already know the answers. I ask the questions because I want you to re-examine the way you thought then and the philosophy you were developing. That belongs to my past life. Is it important now? You must never underestimate or despise the past. No doubt some of it can be discarded. But in reviewing your memories of those vital years of your life, you will see how the bridges were built between your exoteric and esoteric ideas and experiences, and the way they have been integrated. By studying how this was brought about in your own case, you may be able to help others to build their bridges. I see. I suppose I have always believed the past is important. As a scholar of many years' experience and deep study, you know it is. Those who throw away the riches of tradition do so at their peril. You can't flout tradition. If you discard it, you build on sand. We walked on in silence. Then Pan asked, Did you believe in me in those days? As a boy, I loved both the Greek myths and their Norse equivalents. The gods of both mythologies were very real to me. Yet, if anyone had suggested that I might one day see, talk to, 
and even touch one of them, I would have burst out laughing and said, Utter rubbish! And yet, I wonder. Perhaps the strong desire to find a scientific rational explanation for the unusual phenomena you were interested in was a surface veneer, part of the materialistic phase you went through, the I only believe what I see and can demonstrate period you have spoken about. It never succeeded in eradicating a deep fundamental belief in the true reality which was always there. As a kid, I passionately believed in fairies, until it was suppressed by school life and replaced by an irrepressible curiosity to find out how and why things worked, and what became almost an obsessional interest in physics and chemistry. Your original belief was suppressed but not destroyed. What was I to you then? With your interest in mythology, you must have known about me. Was I the nymph-chasing satyr, the being who produced a feeling of panic in woods, an evil spirit, a devil? No, none of these. You were the pen of that wonderful chapter, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, in Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. I stopped speaking and stared at him, as something elusive rose up into my consciousness from the depths of the unconscious. Surely you have always been the wonderful and beautiful being you are to me now. Is that why? It is the reason why you were not afraid of me when I appeared to you. One of the reasons why you were chosen. We came to a seat beside a tree, not very far from the special corner we were making for, and sat down. My appearance must have come as a surprise to you. I laughed. Of course it did. But luckily for me, seeing and talking to the little fawn, Kurmos, broke the shock it might otherwise have been. I assume that was their purpose. I looked at him. You are an awesome being, you know. You radiate such a power. But you are not frightening, at least to me. I must always have felt love for you. Otherwise, as a human being, I would certainly have been afraid. But you were not. And in you I found what I was looking for, a mediator who could be used to help to bring about the reconciliation between man and my kingdom, and also tried to lift the stigma that was imposed on me by the early church. The coming years will show to what extent that is happening. We sat in silence for some time. Will a time ever come when I might lose contact with you and the elemental beings? If, for example, I had other work to do. You have other work to do, as you already know. But you will never lose contact with me. That bond, once made, is forever. Wherever you are, I shall be, for I am everywhere. You could not break the bond even if you wanted to. One of my functions is to look after you, to protect you, to take care of your physical body and help you in your work. I am one of those who overlight you. As for the elementals, my subjects, they accept you, they acknowledge you, and they love you. They will never let you go. I smiled wryly. And what of the ancient legends and ballads that tell of the feet of a mortal man who gets involved with fairy lands and the little people? Disappearing into the hollow hills for years, like Rip Van Winkle or Thomas the Rhymer? And what of the hobbits and the elves of Rivendell, of Lothlorien, of Celeborn and Galadriel? Are they not the best of company? So far you have not vanished into any hollow hills. At least, not for long. You read Tolkien. My literary tastes are impeccable, he gave an enigmatic smile. I don't read, of course. But in a way, I am involved. He smiled at me. I suppose you know that you are closer to the elves than any of the others of my subjects. Do you feel lost? 
No, I do not feel lost. I believe in God. My link with the cosmic Christ is strong. I am dedicated to work for the light. All the same, I feel in some way different. You can't be anything else because of what has happened to you. Does it worry you? No. It is part of the price I have to pay, and I do so willingly. I looked at him and grinned. I don't have any choice, do I? Not much. We chose you, and yet you began it yourself. Explain how and when. You'll find out some day. You must have patience. Pan gave one of his strange, enigmatic smiles. I shrugged. I need plenty of that. And then I laughed. Sitting there perfectly still, in a state of greatly expanded awareness and sensitivity, with the mounting joy this produced, overwhelmed by the love pouring over me from this beautiful being beside me, and from all the nature spirits in the garden, many of whom had gathered round us, as well as from the trees, bushes, and plants, I felt so deeply moved I could not speak. It was almost more than my physical body could take. Pan, fully aware of what was happening to me, took both my hands in his and looked into my eyes. The feelings did not lessen, but a profound peace, tranquility, and wonder was added. I was totally unaware of the passing of time. At last, speaking with difficulty, I said, You seem to feel this bond with my lower self, my conscious ego, just as much as with my higher self. I'm overwhelmed by this tremendous flow of love. Of course, it has to be so. He had released my hands, but was still looking into my eyes. My relationship with your higher self cannot be expressed. It can only be understood on higher levels. He rose. Let us go to the far corner, the one you call my corner. I rose and joined him, and we walked over the grass. To me you are so real. I looked round at one or two people walking about in the garden. In fact, in some strange way you are more real than those people who cannot even see you. He glanced at me. Of course I am more real. Somehow, the thought of this eternal, true reality being mainly rejected by man depressed me. It was as if I experienced a sudden reaction from the previous joy. Man has developed his intellect for what? I asked. We believe that he lost his sensitivity and was cut off from contact with the other kingdoms and with God in order to do so. What has the so-called development of intellect led to? Greater and greater ability to trick, cheat, and destroy his fellow men, and exploit the earth and the other kingdoms for his own selfish ends. How can you and your subjects bear to share the earth with us? There are times when I am bitterly ashamed of my fellow human beings. Pan put an arm round my shoulder. Come now, he said, you mustn't look on the black side like this. Your higher self must be off duty. I shall have to take his place. It is true that man is dull and is doing terrible things, as you say, but he is also doing great and beautiful things. Many men reach great spiritual heights in their lifetime. Sometimes they are great beings in incarnation. Concentrate on the good and the beautiful. Turn your back on the sensational headlines. Read inspiring books, of which you have many. Listen to great music and lose yourself in fine paintings. Never forget that great art, in every sense of the word, literature, music, painting, and so on, contains behind it the true reality, the eternal truth, the spiritual teachings, and in some cases the basic truths of the ancient wisdom, and is a source of the great esoteric teachings, though concealed in symbolic terms. Of course you are right. 
But I find it difficult to understand why so many people despise art, failing to realize its purpose, and in spite of their boasted enlightened intellect and civilized behavior, take the true reality for imagination and hallucination, and believe that the illusory is the real. Pan smiled. Like Plato's men in the cave turning their backs on the truth and taking the shadows on the wall for reality. I laughed. The sudden black mood had passed. What? Pan talking of Plato? Why not? After all, I am Greek and proud of our philosophers. At least my seeming appearance is Greek, though my origin is much older. Talking of my appearance, what do you feel when people say I must be ugly? Disgusted and horrified. So I realize that few, if any of them, have actually seen you. What they are criticizing is an imaginary picture, conjured up from the description of you as half-human and half-animal, with horns and cloven hooves. I mustn't blame the human imagination for its lapses. I often wish they could see the reality as I do. You are a being of incredible beauty. The mischievous twinkle appeared in Pan's eyes. Gross flattery will get you nowhere. It happens to be the truth. Unfortunately, my debased counterpart, Antipan, has received most attention from artists because he is more easily contacted. And, as you suggest, human imagination, where I am concerned, tends to be gross. And so the wrong image of me is perpetuated, and I am depicted with exaggerated horns, a beard, and animal legs, usually goats. It is unimportant. I prefer not to be represented in any material form. Unfortunately, the pictures of my opposite can channel negative energies and could even at times be evil depending on the personality and degree of spiritual development of the artist. By this time, we had reached the special corner I associated so strongly with Pan, and we stood in silence for a time. We spent quite a while then, walking about, circling the trees and bushes, or just standing still. In spite of the proximity of a busy street on the other side of the hedge, there was a strange hush, a feeling of being almost on another plane of existence. That was why it had become the focal centre for the nature forces in the garden, and why I had to come here with Pan for some particular reason on this day and make an essential contact, though I had often been aware of him there and even seen him. The contact made, we left that part of the garden, going along the path that runs in front of the herbaceous border and then crossing the grass to the beech tree under which I was sitting when the whole thing began in March 1966. There was no seat beside the tree now, so I stood leaning my back against the trunk, exchanging energies with the tree. The heightened awareness was as strong as ever. I could no longer see Pan, but was aware of his presence. Kormos appeared in front of the tree where I had first seen him. He was laughing. He danced round the tree just as he had done at that first meeting, and then started off in a wide circle round the one I was leaning against, circling it several times, spiralling in towards me until he stopped opposite me and bowed. An exalted company today, am I welcome? You are always welcome. I left the tree and started to walk in the direction of the east gate, the one I had entered by, accompanied by the little fawn and several elves who had joined us. We went as direct as possible across the garden to the gate. As Kormos and I reached it, Pan appeared beside the elves, who were a little behind us, and raised his arm in a farewell greeting. Kormos came with me out onto the main street. "'Are you coming back to the flat with me?' 
I asked him. You will be very welcome. No, I'm only coming part of the way. This is one of my busy days. I grinned at him, is it? Yes, it is, he said gravely. He laughed. I'm glad I was the first nature spirit you saw. Are you becoming conceited about it? What is conceited? Being pleased with yourself and showing it. Comus laughed delightedly. I am always pleased with myself. Is that wrong? No, not in your case. You've every right to be. He looked at me with curiosity. Aren't you pleased with yourself? Not very often. But you ought to be. Existence is so joyful. Only rarely so for human beings. He looked downcast. But that is sad. I know it's true from the thoughts I pick up and the things I see. I am not unhappy, Kormos. Though there is much to condemn in human behavior, there is much to rejoice in. And from time to time, wonderful experiences such as this afternoon in the garden. I am content, but I am not pleased with myself. I fail in so many things. He looked astonished. I don't believe that. At least you haven't failed in your contacts with Ben and with us. Isn't that something to be pleased about? Yes, Kormos, it is. I am a privileged person and I know it. He smiled. That's better. You know that we all love you very much and we will help you as much as we can. All of us. Thank you, Kormos. That gives me confidence and makes me very happy. It's fully returned. I felt light-hearted and laughed. Now I must go. It's your busy day. Yes, my busy day. He looked at me, chuckled, and turning, ran back the way we had come, gradually fading out as he did so. That evening I wrote up the first part of my account of the day's events, but was unable to finish it as I had an engagement. On the following evening I continued the account, sitting in my back room in front of the gas fire. The room was comfortable and quiet. The material was coming with fluency. There were no barriers, no hold-ups. I usually feel when I am writing up accounts of my experiences that I am being overlighted and will neither forget anything essential nor embellish the account. At the moment, Pan is sitting in the armchair almost opposite me where he has been since I began writing. Did all those exchanges actually take place the other day in the botanics? Or are you giving me more now while I am writing? Am I adding anything myself? It's important to me that it is authentic. Of course it is important. It is authentic, as you well know in your own higher being. You are adding nothing. Our exchanges took place in the form of images and symbols as usual. Some of these were not fully realized into words by your mind at the time, but they were deeply impressed into your unconscious level and are now being realized into words under my guidance. I am overlighting you during the whole of this transcript. Nothing is being left out and nothing added that should not be there. Personal coloration on your part is kept down to the minimum. When we go through it together later on, if there are any mistakes or wrong transcriptions, I will give you the correction. Proceed in faith. Thank you for the reassurance. I am always aware of the danger of false transcription or coloration. Very wise. Now, I want to return to your life at Cowford Cottage. I want to be certain that you consciously realize its full significance in your development. What am I not realizing? I am well aware of the importance of the close contact with nature. At that time, you knew nothing about so-called power points and their associated ley lines. That is true. Does it surprise you to learn that there was a powerful nature point in the wood behind the outhouses? It certainly does. I looked at him startled. In spite of your present knowledge and experience of such points, it has never occurred to you 
to think back to your cottage days? No. I suppose knowledge gained at a later date is not always carried back to an earlier time. Behind the outhouses, you said. That must have been about the middle of the wood. Yes. Once more the mischievous twinkle appeared in Pan's eyes. It was the exact spot you chose to sunbathe on and surrounded by the windbreaker you built. I must really have looked startled this time. Oh, no! This is fantastic! It is true. All through the ten years you lived in the cottage, every time you sunbathed, you lay naked on the ground on a power point, with only a thin waterproof sheet between you and the earth. Rubber does not insulate you from these energies. But I felt nothing, except a charge of energy which I thought was coming from the sun. I knew instinctively it was the right spot to sunbathe on. You were not so sensitive in those days. You were lying in the air, on the earth, in the sun's rays, and afterwards you bathed in the pool you had made by damming the stream that ran past the cottage. The sun symbolizes fire, so you had close and frequent contact with the four elements you talk about over a long period. Is it any wonder that you can communicate with the entities that inhabit those elements? During those ten years, all your bodies were being prepared and conditioned by the energies of that power point. I was so astonished, I could only sit and stare at him. Not only was it a nature power point, but it was also associated with pre-Christian religious ceremonies and rituals of a druidic nature. Now you understand what I mean when I ask if you fully realize the significance of your stay at the cottage. Also, remember, it was on a hillock and surrounded by wood. I drew a deep breath. At the time, all I knew was that it was the right place for me. It certainly was. And now I think that is all for the moment. When I had finished writing, I closed my notebook. Pan had ceased to be visible. As a postscript, Pan had inferred that somehow, though I had been chosen by them, I had in some way started it myself. Preparing this talk for the Findhorn Conference in autumn 1974, I believe I now have the answer. On my last visit to Findhorn, I went with Paul Hawkin to Rosemarkey, a little seaside town on the north shore of the Murray Firth. I had been taken there by my parents during the Easter vacation in 1903 when I was approaching my fourth birthday. There was an enchanting place there known as the Fairy Glen, which I loved and was taken to several times. It was then part of a large estate and was well preserved. I've always had vivid memories of those early visits of a waterfall with two streams of water, a flight of earthen steps, a bridge over a stream, and above all, a wishing well under overhanging rock, with a pebbly bottom into which I used to drop a penny while making a wish. The estate was broken up a long time ago, and the glen has gone wild and natural. The trees are, of course, different, since that visit seventy years ago. They are new trees, that have grown up since then. Some stumps remain of much older ones. Paul and I went right up to the head of the glen where we found the bridge over the stream and the flight of steps, which were, of course, new ones and fairly recent. I found where the wishing well had been under the overhanging rock, now completely filled in, and we came upon the waterfall splashing down into a rocky pool. It was a lovely day and we sat on rocks, looking at the falling water and enjoying the feel of the place. Suddenly, three little gnomes appeared on a flat rock in front of me. "'My, you have grown up,' said one of them. "'What do you mean?' "'We remember a little boy coming here long ago in your time,' said the second one. "'It was you,' said the third, "'and aren't you glad your wish was granted?' "'What wish?' 
Don't you remember dropping a penny in the wishing well and wishing you could see fairies and talk with them? asked the first. And bubbles rose from the pebbles in the bottom of the well, which meant that your wish would be granted, said the second. I certainly did drop pennies in the well and made wishes. I can't say I remember that specific one, but it's very likely true, as I believed in fairies then, as I do once more today. So that could be how it all began and why it happened to me. To anyone who may have expressed a wish to see and talk to nature spirits, whether or not they dropped a penny into a wishing well, remember it took sixty-three years for my wish to be granted, and don't lose hope.